in a world where most people watch movies and then forget about them. These brave heroes join forces to watch them again and then talk about them. Join them in their epic journey as they go back in time, a decade and beyond, to revisit and break down films from a vast array of genres. Do these movies hold up over time? Are they classics? Find out on Retro Movie Roundtable. Starring your hosts, Brian Fry, Chad Robinson, Dustin Melbarnes, Nathan Lutz, and Russell Guest. Coming now to Headphones in Your Ears. Welcome all you lords, ladies, and knights to the Retro Movie Roundtable. Welcome to the show where we watch movies and then talk about them. I'm your host, and joining me today is my good friend and co-host from right here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Mr. Chad Robinson. How you doing, sir? I'm a little under the weather. It's been a rough week, Russell, but I, I am excited to talk some movies today. Yeah, it's not fun to be uh, sick when I mean, it's summertime. Like, I feel like that's a double whammy. Like, yeah, I mean, it's like, how are you going to spend your long weekend in agony and on the couch? Yay. Yeah, I am psyched today because we're doing a Bond show. And if anybody's been listening to the show for any amount of time, you know I'm a big Bond fan. So to join us today, if you listen to the, our Bond countdown, we went back to the Queensland, to England, Mr. Toby Poole. How are you doing, sir? I'm not too bad. I'm not too bad. It's the Jubilee at the moment, so we're all gearing up to celebrate Her Majesty. So it feels like a very uh, fitting film to be watching at the moment with the Jubilee spirit. Long live the Queen. It's, yeah. it's amazing to think it's the same Queen from this movie that came out 53 years ago. <laughs> and just to make the show a little more British, actually, Toby uh, uh, has has a uh, partner in crime there with him. How you, how you doing, uh, GK? Hello. I'm not too bad. Not too bad. How are you guys? I'm good. I'm good. All right. Now let's break the, let's break the ice here a little bit. Let's say you work in the world of James Bond at Q Labs. What gadget are you going to develop to help Bond and the other double O agents on their next mission? Chad? I think I'm going with some form of camera slash selfie flashbang just to blind people. So up a, a cell phone's flash. Like a Men in Black flash, so they don't remember? It, no, no, not going that far. We've got to keep it grounded. No invisible car territory here. Mm, okay. Uh, fortune favors the bold, but go on, to- uh, Toby. What if you? What are you developing for James? I think uh, he either needs a chastity belt or he needs a, <laughs> a, a gun with a baby monitor in it. <laughs> <laughs> Very Even functional. Developments. Very functional. You know, I think part of being a double agent is being very smooth. And I think he needs to have an absorb uh, a gadget to absorb his own flatulence, but then to contain it and to release it later and blame it on somebody else. That will then help him get into the next room in a situation. <laughs> You've really thought about this, haven't you? I, I mean, I, if I'm working at Q Labs, so you really need to think this through. You need to arm him with the one exact thing that he's going to need on that particular mission and get it right every time. Well, he would definitely be one step ahead of the enemy. I feel like this is Basil Labs from Austin Powers and not Q Labs. <laughs> GK, would you would you develop him a sandwich, or is that just is that just your lunch? That unfortunately uh, would not be what I'd, I'd be going for. Although a bond a bond sandwich would be um, would be interesting. No, what what well, no, I mean what I would go for with the way politics are this at the moment is something that can give him an IP address from China at any point. Okay. So, nice. A VPN. Yeah, a yeah. VPN. Okay. Well, I think that's manageable. Effectively, yeah. Yeah. Now, what's the last movie you saw, Chad? I watched another movie from the 1960s. I saw the original Little Shop of Horrors. It's really different from the Rick Moranis version, but I honestly think it's still really funny and it's worth your time. I actually watched that too when we did when we covered that movie just just for extra credit and I will admit it is kind of funny. It's nowhere near as good as the '80s one with uh, Rick Moranis and Rick stuff. Moranis. But it, yeah, but uh, it's still an interesting check out. It's pretty wild that that is a remake. Yeah. Um, no, I didn't you know, even know that there was a 1960s version. Oh, it is a com- it it is a comedy, so it, it was meant to be funny. So it's not a Mystery Science 3000 like ha ha this is bad. So how's yeah. the puppet? How's the Audrey puppet? Uh, yeah. It's yeah, it, it's much smaller and it doesn't really sing. So there's. But it's that. a comedy. I think they knew it was bad even for the time. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, okay. yeah. So it's it's in Chaz, right? It's not a waste of your time. But I do think the the one with the music and it's the it's the real classic. How about you, Toby? What, what's the last movie you saw? Well, quite fittingly, uh, together we we both watched uh, Top, Top Gun. Gun. Yeah. The 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 original yeah. one or the Maverick the one, original the new one? one. We'd, 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 we'd never seen it. Uh, oh, never. No, no, no. We wanted to find out what it was all about, and it turns out what it's all about is um, homoeroticism. Yes. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> that is, uh, I'm, no, there's no arguments here. You, you found yourself in good company. Now, somewhere else in this podcast, I have co-hosts uh, who are in the floor upset, but I mean, I'm okay with. Hey, I love the movie, but I understand the beach volleyball scene is just straight up male on male bonding. Yep, yeah, it is. It, it's um, it's a, it's a lot. It's uh, but you know, it's a very American film. You know, a very 1980s film. Yeah. Uh, now, but, yeah. Hopefully, we'll get along to the new one. Now, this one, the last one I watched, I think everybody will appreciate this. I watched this, and then I had to watch From Russia with Love. I just had to keep – once I once I crack open a Bond movie, they tend to come in, in multiples for me. In so pairs, yeah, like they no do. Talk. Yes. So uh, I did From Russia with Love, and uh, got to say I had a good time with that too. So. But How do you think they compare as 60s Bond films? Like what kind of differences? Uh, well, I, but I think we'll get into that because, I mean, this yeah. movie this movie has a big point of comparison between – Connery's era and this era, so it's a very good question. So put a pen in that. What movie are we going to cover, though, today, Chad? We are going to cover 1969's On Her Majesty's Secret Service. That's right. It's the last gasp of the 60s here. This movie makes $22.8 million. It comes in at 11th on the box office here in the United States. It comes in behind Goodbye Columbus and ahead of I Am Curious, Yellow. And it's number one movie that year was Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. So it actually does pretty well in the box office. Uh, it has an IMDb rating of only 6.5. Uh, the critics of Rotten Tomatoes like it at 81%, but again, the audience score is pretty low at 64%. So the people don't seem to appreciate this movie very much. Now, it's also been given this legacy that it was a box office flop, and as I had just mentioned, it really wasn't. It was the number one movie in the U.S. for four straight weeks. There's just this persistent belief that it didn't perform well, and in fairness... Connery's movies had been making more money, so this was profitable. It made money, but Connery had blown the doors off the place by making you know $100 million worldwide in a movie and grossing $87 million worldwide in, in one movie. So this is completely behind that. It's kind of like what happened with Star Wars, like with Solo, a Star Wars movie, where it was a box office plot. It really wasn't. It just didn't make as much money as they were accustomed to making with the series. So given that, uh, mixed legacy, you know, Toby, I know you had this ranked at number three on our bond countdown. I know you like this movie. Tell people what your background with it was. When was the first time you saw it? What's it like coming back to it now? Well, the first time I saw it, my main memory is that I was absolutely uh, shocked that there was no singing in the titles because every other Bond film I'd seen. And it was just a, when I was little, it was a bit of like a weird aberration, as I think it is for most people. You know, you've got lots of Connery, you've got lots of Moors. But you've only just got this one Lazenby and you sort of you half remember it. So I didn't really think that highly of it. And then, you know, probably about 10 years ago was the first time I cried while watching it, uh, I think. And I just it's got more pathos than your usual Bond film. Uh, yeah, and it's stylistically very interesting. I think that the, the direction and the editing because it was directed by the editor uh, of the series. Right. Uh, Peter Hunt. Uh, yeah. So he, you know, he knew what he was doing and he really understood the sort of Bond. And he, and he brings it back to the roots. I think this is the quintessential 1960s Bond film. I, I, think, I think it's the, the, the sort of zenith of everything that they managed to achieve uh, in terms of plot, character, direction, writing. Uh, and as much as I love Connery, and I do think Connery is on the whole a better Bond yeah, I think this just sums up the 60s a bit more. And I'm a massive Doctor Who fan, and I think there's a, there's a lot of crossover with how this is directed and, you know, a lot of those sort of weird scenes in, in the um, Shilthorn, where it is Gloria. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. GK, how about you? Would you come to this one? I saw this film about just about four years ago, in 2018. Um, and I remember being really blown away by the just the richness of the colour, really, the richness of, of the colours in it. And you know, sort of like what Toby was saying earlier, you know, I quite I quite like myself early 1970s, um, so like sci-fi films, and you know, it's got 
tones of those of sort of that genre of film really. It's not the same. It's not it's not exactly a sci fi film at all, but yeah, it's definitely got sort of tones there. You can see, you know, I think the um just the richness really and the sort of optimism that you had in, you know, nineteen sixty nine going into nineteen seventy. Because obviously the kind of time when man had just walked on the moon and so on and so forth it was a good time. Now, Ch- Chad, what about you? What was your first time taking this in, and what was it like? Yeah, it was probably 20-plus years ago, maybe even longer than that, that I first saw it. And it, it was something that I kind of didn't give a fair shake to, just because Lazenby is such a weird one-off. Toby mentioned the, the opening credits are different. The end credits doesn't mention Bond will return. They do so many weird, different things with this movie, and so I... I don't think I gave it a fair shot. I returned to it for our countdown, uh, probably covered it a couple times before that, and I think it's improved in reputation with me. It's it's still an oddity. It It's almost difficult to categorize. I, I do prefer From Russia With Love if we're talking about 60s era. That's, that's very, very high on my list, but I... I do think this one deserves more credit than what it's typically given. Yeah, and I think you had this at 11 on your countdown. Mm-hmm. So, and I was pretty shoulder to shoulder with you. I had this at 12. And um, I I didn't see this one until on the late end of the spectrum. So I was certainly out of college. It wasn't as long ago. I mean, maybe about 10 years ago or something like that. Uh, once I had really, you know, at some point it clicked into gear. I not just I don't just like these Bond movies. I'm like a huge fan, so I really started getting into them. My own. This is the only thing I own double copies of. I own all of them in DVD and all of them in Blu-ray. I uh, I listen to James Bond specific podcast. I I watch all the DVD extras. I I ingest as much stuff of this as I can. I love this stuff. So for me, there's absolutely no bad Bond movie. You're gonna have a good time if you're watching Bond. And this one grew in reputation with me over the time. When I first watched it, I had already been told, like, this isn't a good Bond. Oh, that's the bad Bond movie. Like, that's the like this was such a disaster. They went back and they paid Sean Connery so much money just to come back. And it had this stigma on it. And you know what? It, you know, I don't think La- Lazenby is not that bad. And the movie, while having, having some distinct differences, and they probably tweaked the formula more than was wise at the time, especially when you're introducing a new guy playing him, I do think this it gains a lot of momentum, and it doesn't seem as much of an outlier now that we live in the Daniel Craig era, which um, is Absolutely. more grounded. And so Absolutely. it has grown into it, hasn't it? It's correct. And now it's and in a weird way. It's like a little bit of a bridge to the Connery and the more pivoting eras, because that's when it hits, and also this to the grittier Daniel Craig era that we would later go on to have. Obviously, it's not quite as gritty as that, but I mean, it, it in a weird way, it's its own thing that actually is now binding some of this together. So, strange way of saying that. Yeah, I think it's definitely been good for the franchise long term. As you say, when it was first released, it's it's so experimental. You know, they they did the opposite of what most movies do now, where they just go with the formula. You know, they didn't really have a they they messed with the formula as much as they could which was brave. It didn't pay off completely, and they did go straight back to Connery. But I think it showed that someone else could be Bond, and it could work. And that was a very big thing, because up to that point, just Sean Connery was James Bond. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, we are going to spoil this movie, so after this message, we will be back, and we will spoil On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Welcome to the All 80s Movies Podcast. I'm Bill. And I'm Jason, and this is the podcast where we talk about the blockbusters, the flops, and everything in between from one of the freshest decades for movies, the 1980s. So whether you're a brain, a jock, a valley girl, or a Jedi, we've got some 80s classics for you. Do these movies stand the test of time? Are we discovering something new? Is there an 80s movie we're finally watching for the first time? Join us each week as we dive into the cinematic nostalgia that inspired and influenced a generation. From the hits to the cult classics, we'll discuss our earliest memories, favorite scenes, fun facts, and our not-so-favorite movie moments, too. It's the All 80s Movies Podcast, now available on all major streaming platforms. Please subscribe and happy listening.
All right, we're back. And Chad, for those who haven't seen On Her Majesty's Secret Service since 1969, do you want to refresh people's memory? Absolutely. James Bond saves a woman from committing suicide and later meets her at a casino. The woman, Contessa Tracy de Vicencio, I can't pronounce that correctly, sorry. Italian Tracy D. Yes, <laughs> uh, those of Italian heritage are very angry at me, winds up being the daughter of a European crime syndicate. Bond is kidnapped and taken to meet Tracy's father, Mark Ange Draco, who tells Bond she's out of control and needs a man to dominate her, a line that surely holds up to the test of time. He offers Bond a million pounds to marry Tracy, which Bond refuses but agrees to romance her if Draco helps him track down Ernst Stavro Blofeld, the head of Spectre. After returning to London, M relieves 007 and Bond attempts to resign. Moneypenny alters his resignation, changing it to a re request of leave. Bond flies to Portugal to attend Draco's birthday party and begins romancing Tracy. He learns that Blofeld is attempting to claim the title of Count Balthazar de Blochamp and has been corresponding with London College of Arms genealogist Sir Hilary Bray. Bond assumes the identity of Sir Bray and meets with Blofeld, who claims to be researching cures for allergies. Unfortunately, this is a front and allergy sufferers like myself are left without hope. Blofeld is actually researching biowarfare and plans to spread infertility across the world until he's paid his ransom. Bond blows his cover by sleeping with pretty much every girl on sight and manages to escape Blofeld's jail. He's captured once again, this time by Irma Blunt, but manages to escape by skiing down from Blofeld's headquarters in a thrilling chase. Tracy picks up Bond and they escape, hiding in a barn overnight where Bond confesses his love for her and proposes marriage. The next morning, Blofeld sets off an avalanche and captures Tracy, but Bond manages to escape. M forbids Bond to mount a rescue mission, but James calls on Draco and his men to attack Blofeld's headquarters, rescuing Tracy in the process. The facility is destroyed, but Blofeld escapes. Bond and Tracy marry in Portugal, but as Bond is removing flowers from their car, Blofeld and Bond commit a drive-by shooting of the car. Bond survives, but Tracy is killed. We don't even get a James Bond will return in sequence, so we're left to wonder if this is the end of James Bond. Yeah, so uh, that was a long summary because this is a long movie. There's a lot that happens in this movie. I would say it's more ambitious than a normal Bond movie. Uh, and we talked about this wasn't popular at the time. Uh, this is a different type of Bond movie. Toby, now that we're on the other side of the spoilers, I mean, this does not have a happy ending. I mean, this is this is a love story. This is just not James Bond to a lot of people. But clearly, it meets the, must, the, the cut for you. What is it that this added depth that you were talking to works for you before with Connery, the way Connery played him and the, the, the way uh, Moore played him and the way Brosnan played him is just as a psychopath, you know, and, and I think for people who are looking for the thrill, you know, the thrill seeking element of the franchise where they just go around, they bed any woman they look at, but they don't feel that bad if they have to shoot them, you know, they'll just like kill them. Ask, Whatever, you know, that was, it was just a thing and I'm over it. That I, I like that stuff. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I have, there is a place in my heart. I love Dr. No and from Rush with Love um, and Goldeneye, but there's something about the, the bonds who can be wounded, the Daltons, the Craigs and the Lazenby's that gives him his, his humanity and it's a big element of the books and i'm not a purist or anything i don't think we should keep it as fleming did it but i think one of the best things about the books is that he's he's a blunt instrument but that doesn't mean he's dulled to life he's trying to dull himself with alcohol and murder and meaningless sex but he's not always successful and i think that never really came through with connery and it does with those yeah. Yeah, Peter R. Hunt said, the director of this, said he wanted it to be unlike any of a Bond movie that had come before. And it was my film and not anybody else's. And uh, he wanted to make a more realistic film that followed the novel more closely. And I think it's fair to say, generally speaking, this might be the closest one to the books. Oh, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I was shocked when I read it a couple of years ago. I mean, there's some name changes. I mean, there's a little bit of stuff that gets cut here and there. But to your point, I mean... It's unusual for any movie adaptation to be this direct. Even the bit with the snow, the, the, where, the bit where he says he's got lots of guts, which where, where he does sound Australian, by the way. Yeah. That's that's a bad line. 
Um, but that's in the book, you know, it's really, except that they didn't feature Ursula Andress being at the uh, hotel. Oh, that was a mistake. Yeah, yeah. That would have been a bit, um, a bit meta. Yeah, I do think, now I haven't read quite a bit, but we actually did listen to From Russia with Love on audio tape. Uh, we listened to that after watching the movie, and it's really close. So I, yeah. I think as we've gone along, we've changed quite a bit. But I mean, you run out of Fleming books after some point, so at some right. point you're starting to take pieces of short stories yeah, and, you and things that. like that. But I think only like a five you know four or five of the books that have been adapted with the same name bear much similarity so i think you could go back and, and do stuff like the man with the golden gun well chad's on board with that that yeah that's different i'd love that i'd love that i think that'd be the perfect route for the franchise but you know i don't i don't live in much hope of that no, no we're gonna wait we're, i feel like we're in a horrible waiting period it's, we're in purgatory yeah. waiting they for the next bond casino movie Royale, and it worked casino royale is very I don't like to wait that long. I mean, if you can make a Fast and Furious movie every year and a half, I want I want Bond more often than you know. Three, well, how many? I don't know. I, I won't get. I'll get it off my soapbox. But I, Barbara Broccoli, get back to work. No, you're right, and they can't even say oh, it's quality control because half of the Daniel Craig movies were rubbish. So you can't say oh, we're just making sure they're Quantum. as good as they can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The difference is, I Vin Diesel isn't. He can't do anything else other than Groot. <laughs> So he, yeah. <laughs> he he's happy enough financing everything exactly. through Fast and Furious. Bundling them out every six months. Right. Yeah, I, yeah. So people, whatever reason, they chafe at the Bond role. I feel like Roger Moore is pretty much the only one that wasn't really irritated by the part. He just got too old and creeped out by women that were younger than his granddaughters. <laughs> Eventually. Yeah, Eventually. it took him a while. Yeah. I mean, it worked for it worked for a long time before it got to that point but yeah you um, put on your clothes and i'll buy you an ice cream yeah <laughs> yeah so uh you mentioned before this movie is different chad than other bond movies the cold open is different uh you know we don't even see lazenby uh lazenby sorry i'm an american so i'm gonna say lazenby i'm trying <laughs> i'm trying to do a better i'm whatever trying to say lazenby. Like, right? yeah whatever. so we see lazenby only later we shoot him from behind we shoot him from a distance we shoot we see his chin we see him in silhouette like they're intentionally not showing you this bond and uh we meet the bond girl right away on the beach she's she's you know trying to commit suicide and he saves her uh oddly enough she faints as he's saying saving her i uh, that, that was a bit odd um but um yeah <laughs> And then they break the fourth wall right away. He looks to the camera after dispatching with some baddies, and he says, "This never happened to the other guy. You have no, you have no music in the credits. Sorry, you have music, but it's instrumental. You're not mm -hmm. singing. You know, you're not singing a song by Shirley Bassey at this point. It's uh, right away. They're showing you clips of the the previous adventures through the Connery era, almost as if to say, like, don't worry, you're watching. A, you're still watching James Bond, <laughs> and." Um, Q is barely in this movie. The gadgets are removed. Radioactive lint is almost the best that we get for <laughs> gadgetry in this movie. Yeah. Q deserves better than that, I think. But I mean, yeah, it's like a reaching, just too horned in. I was yeah. thinking about that, and I'm surprised this movie does as well with you because your complaints about the Daniel Craig era is it's too grounded, and there's not any gadgets, and there's not that much fun, and then there's this movie which. There's nothing special about his car. It's a Mercury Cougar. There's nothing special about any anything on him, and it's it's not particularly fun. It's a sad story. It's true. It's true. And I gotta say, the fun comes from moments here and there. Tracy, quite honestly, is what makes yeah. it so good. She, yeah. pound for pound, probably is the best bongo we've had. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I, I'll argue you that you know as far as how she's developed i mean if people say this era was very chauvinistic she can hang with bond she is his getaway driver she saves his butt she you know takes you know she's she can ski with the best mm -hmm. of them and yeah. uh, she's awesome so she, he distracts blofeld you know she yeah. has the nouse to to be like hey this guy fancies me i can make him you know not think rationally for a bit so over the whole course of the series, we see a wide range of people. You know, on one end of the spectrum, we've got Britt Eklund, 
on the other hand of the oh. spectrum. And, yeah, sorry. Oh. Uh, <laughs> why, why take that shot? Why Why do you have to go after my girl? What does she do to you? <laughs> I, Russell's just unreasonable. Uh, <laughs> but on the other end of the spectrum, we have we have Diana Rigg, and she's awesome. I mean, she she's great, and I think the the character of her father is a lot of fun too. Of you know this mischievous like going in behind the government's back and taking these illegitimate ways to go back and get his daughter and stuff. There's a lot of fun with that, and I have to say it's totally Austin Powers in many ways. But the whole Angels of Death and stuff like that, it's it's kind of funny to watch them like slip into all these rooms and in womanize and. Uh, <laughs> And to, you know, be playing this, like, I thought you didn't like men. It's like, normally I don't. <laughs> like, and like, and, and he uses the same pickup line back to back with the women and they all work. It doesn't matter what he's saying. They just like him. So, I mean. It is fun, but they're filled. We all do. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun, but it feels like there's some tonal whiplash with the rest of the movie, which is this pretty earnest romance. And then for half an hour, he's like, yeah, forget her. Right. I'm just gonna do what I like. He did say he did, he did say like uh we can't we can't uh, we're gonna make an honest woman out of you and we can't be sleeping together anymore. And he puts her up on a little bed and then later he takes a pitchfork yeah. out like about and I say later I mean like thirty seconds 30 later seconds. like he's like hmm I decided I don't like this plan. And he like <laughs> knocks it out and rolls her on top of him and so uh, he is still uh, he still likes the ladies I think in this he'd movie. Be tired. Yeah. <laughs> go at it for like two weeks. But yeah, I mean I mean when he's I don't know. I think if I had if I had one criticism of how um, um, what's her name Tracy has, has played out, the fact that she reappears at very random point in the film. Mm-hmm. She's just ice skating it, in the middle it, of Switzerland. It makes, <laughs> right. It, it makes sense in the chase, but I think that I think you know. Then again, there's there's the argument that the chase is kind of dragged out. Really. She's gone for. 45 plus minutes so it is it is odd to see him just this is probably the highest betting count i can think of of any bond film because it's i'm it, sure it had to be more at some point uh, he's got like nine in a row though yep yep from he's crossing off those continents isn't he yeah he's got his little map of the world and he's going tick venezuela tick it's funny we, we covered robin hood prince yeah. of thieves and uh, alan rickman's like i'll see you at nine I'll see you at ten. <laughs> and bring a friend and like. Literally. And now, uh, and he's literally doing that in this movie. He's like, come by at seven. Come by at eight. Eight, nine. I can squeeze you in at nine thirty. Really? Yeah. Um. Yeah. It's not the best. <laughs> oh, they have fun. There is good spy stuff in this movie though too to your point chad like i mean you know even just copying the documents like this is a boring scene that i think would be edited out this is a long movie and i'm shocked it didn't get edited down more i feel like i'm watching a director's cut in this and uh there's like a whole like five minute scene to watching him making a xerox mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's reading a playboy in that too because he's got to get his appetite going yeah. Well, that's because that's where Fleming's first work was published was Playboy. So oh, I did. I actually didn't realize that. That's cool. yeah. That was an homage to where Fleming got his start. That makes sense. So there you go. It's not just a dirty magazine, people. <laughs> Chad reads it for the articles. He was reading it for the articles. <laughs> Again, Toby, you you do love this movie. What are some things that aren't working for you here? Like, are you okay with this? Like impersonating bond as master of disguise did not work for many people in today's era in the previous movie like where he's coming off as asian and you only live twice he's doing it again here by by playing uh by playing hilly oh you this know, is this wildly stuff. different than yellow face man <laughs> he's being dubbed by another actor who he's impersonating it's not much it it, it, it is very different I oh the, i was so, gonna yeah. say this is not in the same spectrum of offense <laughs> no, no, not quite, not quite. The first time Although, I watched it, I'll be honest with you, I did not quite catch it right away because he was calling himself that, and because his voice is dubbed, I'm sitting there going like, "Who's this guy?" What's <laughs> and like, and I did catch on. I, I mean, like, I was like, "Oh, he's in disguise." Yeah, I get. Yeah, okay. And I did miss that, but 
They I, I, was, I was sitting there going like, man, I'm watching a lot of this guy who's like a <laughs> there's a lot of genealogy right now. A little heavy with <laughs> little heavy with the genealogy. Back off that. Well, yeah. it's 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 really going in with the uh, ver- verisimilitude uh, of the spy stuff. And to be honest, I don't really love the idea and concept. But in execution, it's not too bad. I think uh, Hilly has uh, some pretty good scenes, especially with Blofeld. Um, I think the scenes of them two together are actually quite suspenseful, and you can it tells you quite a lot about Blofeld's character. And George, he doesn't do a bad job. It could be, I think it'd be more embarrassing if it had been Roger Moore doing it. But, um, you know, Lazenby kind of underplays it. He wrings some comedy out of it. Um, and, it, yeah, it's not as bad as it could be. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the uh, I got to say, this movie is good in The Office. When he goes into London, this is actually one of my favorite interactions in The Office. I love Money Penny switching his resignation to, to a couple weeks leave. And we find out later it wasn't just Money Penny doing it. It was M, you know, knowing that uh, not wanting him to resign. And after James is like, what would I do without you? And uh, a couple seconds later, M like rings and is like, and what would I do without you, too? I love that. And it's kind of cool to see Bond go to an office and start to empty out his desk, looking back at his, um, looking at his previous adventures, and almost like a, well, I'm done with that mm-hmm. kind of moment. So he's good. He's good in those moments. Yeah, absolutely. He is. Is um, he's got a very tense relationship with M, um, and I think they just you don't even realize that they've never acted together. You know, it feels so normal straight away. The chemistry between them is really, really natural. Yeah, it is. And uh, so I do think there's another funny thing, Chad, that you mentioned earlier that they would never do in the Craig era, like when Ruby's writing the number of her room on his leg under the table while he's wearing a kilt. Like, <laughs> there's, there, there is funny stuff in this, and I, I, I do think that this movie keeps it light enough for You know what they camera. did with that, right? So Lazenby put a warm sausage under his kilt for that scene, so when Angela Schooler, who played Ruby, goes to as write, one would, but yes, go on. Yeah, when she goes to write her number, she's rubbing against this warm sausage, and she's she was a pro, like she kept a straight face, but he he did that kind of stuff. He was he was a bit immature, I think. I, Toby mentioned the kind of tenseness with Bernard Lee. There may have been tense moments because he. he Lazenby knocked Bernard Lee off a horse and so he he injured him while just messing around he broke someone else's nose during the test run broke two of his own arms doing stunts he wasn't supposed to be doing delayed filming so he was uh he was a bit of a diva for a first time actor they got a younger bond he's a he's a little he's he's wilder this is the youngest bond to start and he's He's 28. He looks old for 28, but I'd name every, everybody in the 60s is smoking and drinking hard. And I've thought this before. I, I've thought this before, like, when you go back and like, Connery's how old? Like, um, As soon as I saw this movie open with the cigarette with Bond, like, it goes straight to the smoke thing. I was like, well, I know what Russell's change one thing is going to be. Every, every time... We get a movie like this, Russell. I don't know. There's there's some other things you could pick on. I mean, having the mole removed would have been a good start. This is def- <laughs> this is definitely the genesis of where Austin Powers goes mole. Yeah. <laughs> it it oh, is distracting. It is distracting. It is. I I I only was waiting. At least the guy who he was impersonating also had one, but it wasn't as distracting. But I. I kept sitting there going like, oh, man, is it going to start moving from which side of his face? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think they had the ability to do that cleanly with plastic surgery. And speaking of plastic surgery, the makers of this actually considered being like, oh, he looks different now because he had plastic surgery. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad they didn't go that route. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we just got the fourth wall break and then they moved it on. Yeah, I, I like. I honestly, I like the fourth wall break, and I kind of wish they'd do a little more of that when they change over bonds. I yeah, mean, exactly. you don't have to have him like, wing. yeah, you don't have to have his arms disappear in a blasting beam of light. You mentioned liking right. Doctor Who and then regenerate as the next guy, but I mean, I like that little tip of the cap, and I think fans of the series 
know that the series is going to change when that happens, and that's that's okay to. I, I again, there's there's a lot of fun here in these '60s Bonds movies, and um, and some of it's the times that we laugh at, you know, whether like that scarf that he's wearing, you know, I mean, uh, but other times it's just genuine fun that they do, and I, I, that sense of fun I miss in some of the more recent movies. So yeah, absolutely. Not everything is this world-ending, like right thing. Event, yeah. yeah, and I think this movie, for all its sadness, it captures a lot of uh, warmth and and you know, dare I say, love for the first time really in the series. And there's a reason that they went back and drew from the well of nostalgia with no time to die. So Connery, Connery is burnt out after you only look twice. He yeah. was he was harangued like people in Japan treated him like he was Elvis, and it was exhausting. And he unfortunately was not really treated very well, in my opinion, by the producer Saltzman and Broccoli. He became a massive star. He built the series up, and they wrote a contract uh, saying that you would be paid this much. And they their attitude was, "We made you a star. Like you'll be like you're going to be taken care of forever. Like look what we've done for you." And Connery was like, "This series is way more popular than you ever realized, and I'd like to renegotiate my contract because you guys are swimming in money, and you're, I'm not reaping the benefits of it, even though I helped create this character." And in fairness, that's a very valid argument. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so between the burnout of this and between what it was happening with money, he was angry. And he, he was in bad terms. And this is why we lose Connery. And they bring in Lazenby, who's not really an established actor. In fact, he's from a chocolate bar ad, yeah. um, which is it's, which is amazing. They uh, I, I won't say they stooped low, but, I mean, they got an Australian he- cheap right yeah certainly and they got an australian to do it how does that go over for people in england do you ever hear about like him being like oh the australian bond honestly not as much as you'd think really uh, I so think it's convincing people, people really rag on him um for, for his acting yeah, well more than his acting, which i think is a bit unfair to be honest i don't think there's anything wrong especially when you consider it was his first film I, mean, I think he would have grown into it. I think each of them yeah. develops. I mean, I think Connery's even a little bit stiff in the first Doctor No movie. Like he's got he's got it down later. Yeah, like, yeah. Lazenby's got the the basics though. He's, he does the fight scenes exceptionally well, and he handles the the spy more, stuff. More more struggling to find his voice in the, the start of it too. Like you know, like they yeah. found out like don't slap women anymore during the Roger Moore <laughs> during during the Roger Moore run. Like when when he did that, they're like, ooh, maybe we shouldn't be doing this anymore. Like. Oh. And it's almost like maybe we shouldn't have been ever been doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so, to your point, I do wonder what would have happened had Lazenby held on to the role. I mean, I know one thing: Peter Hunt shot the end of this movie when Tracy is killed. That is supposed to be the opening of Diamonds Are Forever, and that is much better than Are ending. You joking? Oh my! Oh yeah, yeah. You were supposed to see him ride off into the sunset, oh. and and they filmed all of this all up front so that they can open up the next movie in the cold open to watch Tracy's shot by Irma Bunt. Uh, sadly, she dies, by the way, the woman who plays yeah. Irma. She's awesome. And this this was all supposed to come back. So Peter Hunt was lined up to come back, too. And Lazenby kind of goes off the deep end. Easy Rider comes out, and we covered that earlier this year. This is a movie that kind of redefined Hollywood. It's called The New Hollywood. And everybody was growing beards and growing their hair out, and things were changing as the 70s were Hippies. coming to swing. And Lazenby got horrible advice from his manager, and they said that James Bond is a square. He's got his hair cut. He's wearing suits. This is done. This is 50s stuff, and we're going into the 70s. Nobody's doing this anymore. Get off of this. This is career suicide. They offered him a seven-movie deal for a lot of money, and he turned it down. Worst agent until Billy Joel's agent, who comes along and embezzles all of his money away. But, um, (laughs) But, I mean, literally the worst agent you could possibly get. To give him this horrible advice his career doesn't really blossom from this he gets to do a bruce lee movie with some fighting in it but he is not rewarded for turning us back on this he shows up to the premiere of honor majesty's secret service like with a long beard long hair he doesn't look like bond and as chad mentioned there was some honoriness to him that they might put up with because sean wasn't becoming sean was no longer a blessing to work with either but um <laughs> the diva type nature uh, he didn't. He didn't embrace what it took to be Bond. And even though he certainly looked the part, like his build is good, and I mean, like he, his measurements, like he actually was able to buy one of Sean Connery's unpicked up suits from a tailor to wear it into his audition. And he really 
did an amazing job to talk his way into this role. As I mentioned, he didn't really have the resume to stand on, but he faked it well enough to get in there. He definitely faked it until he made it. And so, but it's interesting how he, he fumbles this. You would not get, they, they go back and damage control to pay Connery, not because Lazenby was bad, but because they lost Lazenby. He just flat out walked out on the project. Diamonds for Forever was supposed to be Peter Hunt and Lazenby again. And borderline, do you ever, if he signs a seven movie deal, that covers Diamonds Are Forever in the entire Roger Moore era. And uh, I just want to say in a parallel universe, how does that make you feel, uh, Toby? Uh, 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 terrible. Um, <laughs> as, a, as a kid, uh, I remember watching On a Ministry Secret Service and, and just going, what happens next? You know, that this is amazing. Well, we've got serialization. This is going to pay off in the next one. And then, you know, watching the start of Diamonds Are Forever and there's kind of this hint that Bond's angry at Blofeld about something and, and then he just sticks him in a mud pie and the movie moves on. And you realize, nope, we're forgetting about it. And it's uh, it's probably, for me, the biggest creative misstep. In the yeah. Well, Lazenby not wanting to do it anymore, is, you can blame it on that. He has regrets later in life. I mean, he said, <laughs> he's a funny guy to hear interviewed. Like, he'll talk about, like, um, it's great for getting women into bed and stuff like that. I really <laughs> I really enjoyed that part of it. And um, so um, he's a very entertaining listen to it, like a Comic-Con kind of thing. So he, uh, he had fun. Like, he broke the rules. Yeah. He skied when he wasn't supposed to, as Chad mentioned. I mean... He was he was hard to control, but it's interesting. Chad, do you want to live in a world without Roger Moore being Bond? I do not. No, he's my favorite Bond, so please <laughs> do not replace him. This was almost to uh, Timothy Dalton. He was offered the part, but he was only 22, so he turned it down. So we could have had a much longer reign of Timothy Dalton. They knew he was too young then, though. Yeah, yeah, he just he wanted some time and experience. What I do find interesting is Adam West turning down this role. He's, <laughs> I, I kind of want to see Batman do this, but he said, hey, this part should go to an Englishman, and then they cast <laughs> an Australian. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, although yeah. I think it's less egregious, to be honest. I think, um, I think, and uh, uh, sorry, an American. No offense, guys. No, that's, that's all right. I, I don't <laughs> want to see an American. Like, uh, you know, I mean, that's fine. Adam yeah. West would be absolutely horrible too. So yeah, uh, oh yeah, oh, you, yeah, that would have killed it. I love Adam West, but no, not here. Yeah. Roger, yeah. Roger Moore's the English Adam West. You know, he, he did he did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it it's interesting, and we wouldn't have Diana Rigg had we not lost Connery, because part of getting Diana Rigg, she's an Avenger, yes. which was the same quilt that um, Pussy Galore, who was on her Blackman and Goldfinger, came from. And that, they went back to that well again, both great Bond girls, by the way. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Patrick McNeese is also a great Bond girl. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, sure. <laughs> um, so uh, in that though they um they bring in diana she's amazing like i said it's not just the character of tracy diana riggs confidence is awesome in this and because they got a less established actor they get a more established bond girl to put next to him and i think that was a smart move you might not get diana rigg in there had you kept connery and for those that may not recognize the name, that is the Queen of Thorns from Game of Thrones, Elena Tyrell. So much, much later in life, she has an excellent role there, too. I think the Avengers, though, should should do it, right? From 1960s? I don't think many people have seen that. It's, and, and no, it's, that it's is an not... Iconic, it's an iconic role, though. Like, it's like, you know, I mean, for women action characters, that... She's tough in that. So, I mean, that is that that is something that holds up. That's an influential role. I agree, but I think when you say Avengers, people are immediately thinking Iron Man, Spider-Man, Captain America. This is not it. That is not no. what that series was. No, no. And it's not the 90s one with Uma Thurman, and, and sadly, Sean Connery is involved with that, too. <laughs> That's not Sean Connery's best moment. Although it's not as bad yeah. as the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Yeah. Yeah. Or, but it's, uh, on that, that it, it's in that same dragon. tier. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. Highlighted. Um, yeah. 
So it's amazing. Uh, I said Lazenby is 29. Sorry, he's 28. He's 29. I was I was off by a year. But yeah, Connery starts at 31 and then Moore starts later at 45. And they start going older at that point. Like they go 40, 40 for Dalton, 41 for Brosnan and Craig, 38. Toby, do you like do you feel like that's OK? Like, I actually like this younger Bond. You get a longer run out of him typically. It didn't work. Yeah, in this case, true. But I like a young Bond. He looks like he can fight it, like physically. He's good for the action. Oh, he's excellent for the action. I think he's probably the best. Aside from Craig, and this is the thing, is that Craig's like a short ass, um, and he's old, but he does do it. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit indifferent, to be honest with you. I mean, as you say, Lazenby does not look his age at all. Uh, yeah. And Connery kind of looks his age. Uh, in Doctor No, he's got a very like manicured, almost model look to him, like porcelain which uh, does, you know, get weathered away, especially when you get to Diamonds Are Forever in his pink tie. Uh, <laughs> pink. He has a hairpiece for sure by that point. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't like, the, the thing is I don't mind an older Bond like Craig, uh, as long as he stays in shape. If it's going to be like uh, Connery or more, then, uh, you, then you're going to want to go younger. Yeah, yeah. The public was kind of conditioned also to not like Lazenby with Connery leaving who was beloved and you know he was the role to many people the tabloids started to pick apart at Lazenby like there was an interview with Diana Rigg saying like uh, you know like we've got a kissing scene later and then she yelled down to him was like I'm eating garlic I hope you are too and they took yeah. and did you know that tabloids sometimes like to blow something out of proportion to sell papers um so yeah I know right and uh, so it just turned into this thing like they made it made they made it seem like these guys hated each other. And yep. again, Diana Riggs respected in life. So they were just kind of turning the back like this narrative was being weaved to make this fail. And again, it's really not that big of a failure, but it 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 is one of these things where its legacy has gotten better over time. There's been a number of directors who have come back to say nice things about it after over, over time, you know, namely Christopher Nolan. Has yeah, said this, this, yeah. is, this is one of his favorite Bond movies, and it is an influence to him. I, I think Inception. the producers uh, kind of had to disown it for their own good. I see it on TV much less. Yeah, yeah because they, they didn't, you know, that was the aberration Bond, and they didn't really want people remembering it. They wanted people to remember the, the, the Connery and the Moors. And so in order for them to, to save face, they kind of had to disown it, really, which was a shame. But now it's back. So it's fine. Well, they just advertised the character, too. And they've gone back and said it was a mistake. Like before it was Sean Connery as James Bond when they were leading up. It's just they went character, character, character. So there was no attachment to Lazenby. And they've gone back and said, hey, it's a mistake. There's some unique things with that gun barrel scene. He's the only one to kneel down. And it's he's the only one to have the blood actually completely obscure him which is kind of foreshadowing of his career here. <laughs> but, but yeah, the, there was mistreatment, I guess, on both sides. But I don't know. I feel like foreshadowing his career to be to turn around at the gun barrel scene and shoot himself in the face because like he totally like walked out of a role of a lifetime. So, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, so uh, I don't know. Yeah. The um, we, we also have a new Blofeld. Now, we have not talked about Telly Savalos. Now, Toby. Do you like Telly Savalas taking over the role here, previously played by Donald Pleasance, and before that by, un, un, you know, facially not depicted people behind a screen? Okay, well, you know, facially anonymous Blofeld is my second favorite Blofeld. So I do think we need to give him some credit. Uh, Donald Pleasance is really wooden in the role, and he doesn't have much threat, to be honest with you. Ouch. Uh, I never, I'm sorry, I never, you know, one or one facial prosthetic and, and being evoked by the Austin Powers film doesn't make him a very good villain. But Telly Savalas, now this is a man you should be scared of. He wants to, he wants to bed your woman. He wants to make the world infertile. So he's the only, the only person who can breed in the world. He's kind of sexy with his voice. He's powerful. He's clever. Um, he's all the things that the other Blofelds just are not. So, yeah, I absolutely love Telly Savalas. And I think he's probably the best thing about this movie for me. Wow, very high praise. Wow. Chad, you love your villains. Is this a good one? 
I think it's a good one. I am going to push back a little bit because as such a Halloween fan, I want more Donald Pleasance regardless of I I want him back. But to, <laughs> Halloween to, is in Dr. Loomis, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. He's fantastic in those films. I, I, I'm not going to dispute that. But Telly Savias, he does a fantastic job. I mean, he's a great replacement here. So I, I don't mind it. I, I think Blofeld, he, I see so much of the Dr. Evil. Austin Powers has ruined a lot of this movie for me because there's just, he puts him in a closet with an open window pretty much. I mean, that's, and just walks away. There are so many things in this movie. I'm like, can you, can you just, can you post a guard? Can you do anything here? Like, just no, we're going to place him into an easily escapable situation and divert <laughs> our attention to other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the super easy, barely an inconvenience line comes up. Like, that's just how they treat this this Bond character every time he's captured. It's like, okay, which, by the way, is a lot. I felt like this is the most incompetent Bond's ever been because he keeps falling for the same thing. Every time he sees a woman in bed or in a situation, he gets knocked out. Which by the end he's got brain damage because there's it happens like four times in thirty minutes. <laughs> yeah, I, I I like I like Telly Savalos. It is confusing. This movie was supposed to come out at Thunder where Thunderball comes out. Mm-hmm. The the logistics of making this and getting the sites secured didn't pan out. They chose to make Thunderball with Sean Connery. So this movie was very nearly Connery's movie and it was shot earlier. You're supposed to meet Blofeld here before he's been deformed, and thus what you go on to see from him later is, is a different Blofeld and it's more in sequence. So the fact that he's more spry and unmarked and he has no earlobes, but I mean, um, <laughs> so, uh, which, which is a thing that he uses to sell himself as uh, having some genealogy, but this Telly Savalas is supposed to be the one you meet first. And it doesn't make much sense when you've met Donald Pleasance. And I think Donald Pleasance cast a pretty large shadow because I like him so much. This was actually one of the hardest things I kept having a hard time by like look at this telly savalos guy i mean he, he doesn't even hold a cigarette correctly this guy is a joke and um stupid I sexy had, blowfield I, I had, exactly i want my blowfield to be physically inept and just have henchmen carry out his task for him i don't want him skiing after oh, bond himself and getting into a bobsled fight like i want i want what a ridiculous guy... line that just was by the way for someone that didn't watch this yeah. movie a, a bobsled fight <laughs> exactly we've had a wheelchair fight on this mo- on this podcast with uh with the uh unborn on the fourth but not a bobsled fight that's no. a new first one <laughs> yeah i don't want blowfeld into that fisticuffs kind of moment so uh i've come around to it and understanding the continuity being broken like it was is is helpful to know that it is also frustrating. They actually thought about making this instead of You Only Live Twice next. It still had a chance yeah. to kind of play out because he's still unfazed, or he's still, you don't see him in Thunderball, so it's still possible you can sell that. And I wonder, I wonder if Sean Connery does this movie, does he walk off? You don't go to Japan where he's like harangued by everybody as much. And you, uh, because believe it or not, Sean Connery does not blend in when you will go to Japan, despite what the movie You Only Live Twice shows. <laughs> Um, so. Connery has said he regrets not doing this movie so yeah, yeah I, I, I think he's more rewarded as an actor because there's more to chew on here he gets a better movie that's a little more grounded which I think there's some indication that Connery was saying I think we went too far with this volcano layer guys which <laughs> I mean I think I think the fantastic world of You Only Left Twice led the pendulum to swing back the other way and it swings back the whole way and that's how, totally how bond goes this movie is not received well so they swing the pendulum back even farther than they've ever been before and diamonds are forever the movie after this is wildly exaggerated so it, it's interesting how each bond movie responds to its time but also to what happened before it and i'm frustrated because i can't help but think sean a mature sean in this role could have been really good he seems mentally checked out and you only have twice i think it's his worst showing and um, although there's moments in Diamonds Are Forever, too, it's just like, I am definitely here for the paycheck. I'll have you know. <laughs> um, but if you could have gotten him off Thunderball where he's still really good, I I am frustrated at that. It's sitting there going like, oh, man, what could have been? Stupid. Like, they just had a hard time getting the snow to line up with, like, the seasons and stuff and when they wanted to make the movie. And it's, 
just filming logistics that prevented this from being Connery's movie. Yeah, they were um, going to do it right before uh, you only did twice. Yeah. Now, you mentioned before, Peter Hunt, he's been the editor before. He steps into the director's role. This comes out of the a promise. Broccoli uh, works on Chitty Chitty Bang Bang with him. And, you know, he, he kind of mentions to him, like, you'll get to direct a Bond movie. And he's kind of like, when's this going to happen? He gets frustrated. And he literally goes on vacation in, I believe, in Japan. And when they're filming You Only Live Twice, they bump into him. So you can go halfway around the world and bump into somebody. It does happen. <laughs> um, so, it's, it, you know, not ice skating, but still, as unlikely as that is. And uh, they did ask him to direct the upcoming movie with Lazenby. And it's a new Bond. The director has some continuity with the series. He steps into this role and he's being coached with him to go from that like assistant lower role and then to go into the main role. Peter Hunt, obviously he made this his movie. Toby, where are you seeing him as a director and his stamp on this? Well, <laughs> there's a lot more zany colors. There's a lot more weird editing techniques. You can definitely tell that, that the director is more technically proficient, uh, shall we say, than in previous Bond movies. You know, like Guy Hamilton, uh, he's fine. He does the job. He captures all the shots. And I really like that, uh, that helicopter shot in You Only Live Twice where everybody's running across the rooftops. Um, but in this one, it feels more intimate. It feels more personal. You actually see the characters think and interact with each other more. There's more of an element placed, there's more of an emphasis, sorry, placed on what the characters are thinking and, and how that plays across their face. And I think that all comes from him. And I think he made a much more personal movie than we'd previously had. Yeah, he's good with the intimate scenes, I think. Some people yeah. will, could, could write it off as schlocky mush stuff that doesn't need to be in Bond. And I think I've heard it described as that by many, but I'm, I'm okay with it in this case. So I think it was done... Well, I think it's interesting that he would have returned had Lazenby come back. Lazenby did not have a good experience with Hunt. He said that he was frosty. He separated him off and didn't talk to him. And Hunt just kind of, I guess, felt like maybe you'll work better, learn better if we just leave you alone and you need to focus on your acting or what it was. But there was this breakdown. Lazenby was only communicated through through his agent or through his like assistant from the director, like where the director says, I want you to do this. There is a breakdown between your star and this one. I'm surprised the movie doesn't suffer more for that. Yeah, he thought Bond should feel alone, so that's that's why he treated him that way, but I think maybe they, maybe it was because they didn't actually realize how unprepared he was for this role. Because He's he, a rookie actor. You just can't do that. Yeah, but they didn't know that. He bluffed, and apparently fact-checking was not a thing in the 1960s. He, well, he did tell them later. He said, I'm not an actor. And they said, well, you fooled, you fooled three of the biggest producers in, in, the, in you know, the film business. You're an actor to me. Really? So, I mean, yeah. they, they knew by the time he was on the job that, you know, he's a chocolate bar man. That's it. I think I think um, Peter Hunt's direction did a good. Um, I think he did a great job in in getting that performance out of Lazenby, to be honest. And at the end of the day, they're doing a job, and if he needs to do that, then he needs to do it. Um, I don't know if you know about the the story of them filming the last scene, and Peter Hunt made him do it like fifty times. You know, he was just getting him to do it all day until he was physically exhausted, and he was crying over that. And that's that's the take they used was when he was just broken at the end of the day. And, and I know it sounds really harsh, um, but it's a job. And if that's if your boss needs to do something like that and it's not actually pushing any eth ethical boundaries, then I say go for it. Stanley Kubrick did it. Why can't Peter Hunt? Yeah, Stanley Kubrick did much worse. <laughs> so, yeah, um, much, much worse. yeah. Yeah. And um, but I think there's some techniques that are changing for the series here. There's slow motion, like when Bond gets knocked out. Yeah. There's the uh, flashbacks. Yeah. Now, one thing I wish he had gotten rid of that we still have at this point are sped up film. Oh, my goodness. Like, I don't I think those are the worst moments of Thunderball. And I think those are the worst moments here, too. I just cannot like when he's on the the gondola wire and all of a sudden it cranks up real fast. I just mm -hmm. it's in I don't know what they were thinking to still be doing that at this point. That's really troublesome. Do you hear yakety sax whenever that starts happening? Because I do. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't know, man. It's like maybe Benny Hill. Like, is that the Benny yeah. Hill song? Like, that, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, it's. It, I'm shocked Austin Powers didn't do a little bit of that kind of cut. Did they remove some frames from this? I don't know. <laughs> um, in a movie where everything's being taken seriously, it's debatably more egregious. I mean, yeah. so I wish they hadn't done that because uh, some of the skiing stuff's being done by real stuntmen. When they do stuff for real, it's awesome. Mm-hmm. It's really good. And they still that's a trademark of these early Bonds. They do stuff for real. They go to the location, they don't do it in a studio, and they shoot it for real. And that's awesome. And um, so so much so that when they don't do it, it's uh, it's rough. Now, one thing i got to give them credit for, they went there for an avalanche. They were trying to film and set up a place where it was prone to avalanche. They got there too late. The avalanche had already happened. They had a really hard time getting enough snow in this movie because this was the warmest year at that point. And so a lot of the locations that we're using weren't snowy enough. And um, they didn't get an avalanche at all. And they had to use stock footage of avalanche. So if you watch the scenes where there's an avalanche chasing after them, it's actually just stock footage of avalanches. And they sh- they kind of film them closer to the skier, like shaky camera. And then they also cut the miniatures. And the miniatures are not bad. They're just not dumping bad. they're just dumping salt down uh like like literally diorama like shoebox size stuff and like they're just dumping salt down to look like an avalanche and as ghetto as that sounds it looks it, good. Great. it looks much better than sped up film of real people yeah absolutely <laughs> so uh, another a little enclosed set yeah another fun fact here is we talk about the direct editor taking over the director's role john glenn is the editor on this one and if you're not familiar john glenn carries us through the 80s he's he's from free your eyes only through license to kill so he's he's your director through the later more era and and the and the dalton era too oh yes license to kill yeah his magnum opus yeah so i mean that's not that's not chad's favorite run of more so i don't know if that's an endorsement no. or not for to you chad i mean maybe i was keeping might my, have... my mouth <laughs> shut yeah <laughs> like said, john glenn might be where things started to go wrong chad's like Oh, this is the guy to blame. <laughs> he, yeah, he's on my like Steve Buscemi list of uh, <laughs> names to cross off. Yeah, yeah, he's well, well, he's doing some of these editing practices where we're not so sure about why we're continuing at this point. So yeah, mm-hmm. uh, and also the John Glenn is a saint. The the credit roll not only sounds weird by not having a song, but it looks weird. Like yes. the martini glass silhouette with like the diagonal black and uh like seizure inducing black yellow like diagonals going through it not not a not, not a happy to, moment completely disagree whoa <laughs> it's you know it's psychedelic it's weird it is i like it it's, it's doctor who okay it's yeah I, is it bond though well, you true that's a, that's a good good point but i think i mean you only you only look twice we've been hard on it the whole time but i mean go back and watch it's credit reel it's classy it's good smooth good it, it is um, it is lovely i i do agree with that to be fair it helps it helps to have a song like that by nancy sinatra though too what, what you got against john barry guys come on no oh, john it. john barry's score is good throughout this i just don't i just want yeah it's just the way give me three blind mice in the beginning at least <laughs> yeah this the the credits for me felt lazy i mean it's I do feel like it's the most prominent the female figure has shown, like uh, throughout throughout. But it's just martini glass and roll film of other stuff that's happened. There was it wasn't as artsy as we typically get. We don't have a, a good title song. The the Louis Armstrong song I I like the song, but it's I feel like it's a strange one to include, and I'm surprised, Russell, that you like the score, because this is the first transition to synthesizers, and I know you hate synthesizers. Well, they're using a very distorted electric guitars, too, so they're taking that surf rock sound that is there from before, and I think you're still within the... I think it's a progression kind of thing. It's not so jarring. But yes, as he mentioned, Toby said, it's psychedelic, you're not going into the synth pop stuff that would later come in the in like you know, you know the Sheena Easton all time high kind of stuff that would later come and stuff like that where it's just like oh this this is cheese ball. Okay. So, so so Pink Floyd shine on you crazy diamond synth not you know 80s yeah. synth pop yep no, no Devo for you. Right, that's not where that stuff belongs. So okay. um, 
Yeah, and that's why that's and that's where I draw the line. So I mean, Duran Duran, that's your yeah. line. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's a sign of where things were going. People kind of are hard on Lulu's uh, "Man with the Golden Gun" theme song, and it, oh, I think this awesome song. I think it's fine as well, and I think this song leads to that. So I'm okay with it. And and I mean, they can't all be living that die by, you know, wings. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And what do you think about the ending? We haven't talked about this enough. Again. We didn't. It wasn't meant to be this movie, but they realized they weren't going to get Lazenby back, so they kept it in. They released it this way. Irma Bunt comes over, shoots Tracy. It's a tragedy. It's a downer ending. I mean, it's so profound. That's one of the things that made me have a hard time getting around this movie when I, when I first watched it. But it's also one of the things that made make it stick with you. I mean, how does this does this change the movie for you, Chad? It changes it because the bullet is magical. The angle she was shooting from is impossible to get it to go directly through the front of the windshield and into Tracy. So that bothered me a little bit. Like just cut that a little differently. Edited you sound it. like you're from the JFK movie, like the, the magic bullet yes. uh, curving through. <laughs> yes. This was the literal magic bullet, but yeah, it, it definitely changes the tone because it doesn't give you anything at the end of there. There's no victory. It's bond sobbing saying we have all the time in the world and it ends uh, on a that line hole. gets you that line gets you so hard like it's like she's just sleeping yeah yeah so it's and like i said in the beginning we don't get the james bond will return in we got that in no time to die which <laughs> i'm not going to spoil that movie but that's that's an important line that's an i needed important that thing reassurance i needed that reassurance yeah <laughs> So the the look of the sets is less fantastic in this movie. That's one thing that I think is a noticeable difference as well. It's perhaps grounding in a more pits glory as an actual place that it's a restaurant with a rotating top on it on top of a mountain. You can actually go there. Uh, Luke, who was on our You Only Live Twice episode last year, had actually been there to it. And so it's 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 definitely a place that you can seek out. It is amazing. Uh, mm-hmm. However, it is not an underwater base of Dr. No. It is not. It is not so fantastic as the like in Thunder Thunderbolt either. So I mean, even the set pieces are coming down to earth, if you will. It's certainly no volcano lair. Yes, a partially completed restaurant. Yes. Yeah, some of the set work that they do is beautiful. Like like where he walks through like the icy caves to get to Blofeld's yeah. like lounge, which is a strange thing to do. If anybody ever says like, if you leave an established looking room. And then you walk through that catwalk through a cave of ice to then get to another established room. Something fishy is like going the on. Batman villain, man. I know. That's what it was it's... most evocative of. You thought the penguin was going to emerge. I know. <laughs> it was stylistic, and I liked that. Um, yeah. There's a beautiful scene where they drive into a warehouse uh, where Tracy's dad is technically having Bond meet him, and he's like, uh, "I'm glad for you to join me." He's like, "Well, <laughs> you're holding me at gunpoint, so <laughs> I came." <laughs> but but that warehouse is really cool looking when they first land. So there's 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 this moment of this old Hollywood movie magic that is more indicative of what you would see in older Bonds in here. But uh, it's there's still a moment of fantastic nature. And then obviously the ski village. Gosh, as a skier, I just, more than any other Bond movie, these are some of the locations I most want to visit. The little ski village that's down there is just so amazing. I mean, I would love to try bobsledding, not while throwing grenades on it, of course, but I mean, uh, it just looks like an incredible place to go to. And isn't that one of the things we just love about Bond, the travel log miss, part of it? Miss. You know, the world is not enough gets a lot of points from me because they ski, you know. Uh, yeah, it, you get you get two rounds of skiing here. Yeah, you do. It, you I, get, I, when I went to the cinema, some, some American dude said, oh, you know, it was good, but they could have cut down on the skiing. What? Like, yeah. Nah, I wanted not... to go back and go, shame on you, sir. You yeah. Think so. yeah. I, 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 some of my favorite Bond moments are on, on the slopes, for sure. They wanted to do the ski off the cliff and then ex- pull out a parachute. They huh. they didn't work through that here. And if you you know lay, know the series well, later on, they pull that up for The Spy Who Loves Me. You get the glorious death. I mean, I love it. You You get that great scene of just red mist coming up. Oh. <laughs> I did figure you'd like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's I wrote that down in my notes as like somewhere Chad has a smile. Yes. <laughs> Lumps of meat. Yeah. yeah, no, it's great. 
And that's when we get the he had a lot of guts line. Yeah. He had a lot of guts. <laughs> We're all in Europe on this one. We globe trot a little less uh, because, you know, you're in Portugal when we meet Tracy and we're in Switzerland and very much we're in Switzerland the whole time. There's a little bit in London. There's, you're always going to have the London, you know, but check in, the check in with the office. You know, like especially the uh, the sort of um, rescue sequence at the end when the helicopters, it's almost like a proto apocalypse now um, kind of scene. And it just looks glorious and they absolutely make the most of the settings and that's why i'm quite glad that there you know there weren't too many countries as you say it's just three really but um they get everything they can out of those locations and it just looks sublime it does i like it when they they're driving through the ice race rally and then like land in this barn like i wanted some more you know in in today's uh craig era i have many criticisms of that era obviously but they show you the the beauty of the landscape so well i Mm -hmm. wish that you could have some of that not that this movie's this movie's pretty long already, but I do wish they would drink the scenery in a little bit more because it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And the production had a had to battle uh, weak snowfall, and they also had to battle sets that had ceilings in it too. Uh, they had a hard time lighting these things. They're they're confined environments. So credit to the film crew. These were hard places to film in. Mm-hmm. And stop making a lot of thing like technology wasn't there. The opening credit scene, daytime at night, like where you shoot in the day and then you just darken the film down to imply that it's at night when he meets Trace in the beach. Just don't change anything that happens at night in your movies to daytime because that looks so bad also. Yeah. yeah. Um, or at least be consistent with it. It's hard. Like I said, it's, I understand the technology just wasn't there. Otherwise, you shoot at night and you just turn like big, big bright lights on and I get that, but it's it's still it's it's one of those rough moments that makes it not age because much of this movie's timeless. But then those little things pull you back into a little bit here and there. So also the punching your daughter in the face and saying spare the rod, spoil the child. Yeah, that hasn't aged well. Yeah, Tracy gets slapped twice for sure. Yeah, it's uh, it's slapped, again, punched. Yes. Do you, you need the woman? Do you need what you need is a man to dominate her. Right. Yeah, you know, just something a normal dad would say for his daughter. You know, yeah. give her a good I, shagging I, I and, and, and to dominate her. Yeah, I think it works for the character, to be honest. Um, that kind of stuff, and you do get the counterpoint of Bond, sort of being more tender. I like that about Tracy. That makes me like her even more. She's got a defiant streak in her, where she's like, "Now you obey your husband." Now that all the time, she's like, "As I have you." As I have you. Yeah. <laughs> she's awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, she is. She she really is, and she doesn't let you know anything get her down except lead. I it's thought, lead. I thought it was fun to get Bond's Aston Martin to drive on the beach, which they don't like that. Um, they put railroad ties buried under there. They were they 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 made that to make the car drive all the way down to the beach like that. Movie hmm. magic. Yeah, and uh, if you thought the skiing was exceptional, it was. Willie Bogner, a former Olympian, is doing a lot of the stunt work and even getting to hold the camera at some point. It's really fun to hear him interviewed in the DVD extras. He talks about like. Oh yeah, I just I, I made sure to turn my ski a little bit left to kick some snow in front of the camera as I was moving. It's funny to see this athlete turn into a total artist of mm-hmm. of how he's sequencing these things and like turning into a little director himself. I mean, it's really cool. I'm sitting there going like, yeah, you should have had a film career. Like, you know, you, yeah. you didn't just hold a camera. Like, and he's doing all this backwards, by the way. That's why they got him to do some of this uh, footage because you needed somebody to ski excellently on hard slopes, and he's doing just amazingly smooth stuff so the, the footage of him doing the filming is amazing again they're doing all this for real yeah yeah he put the camera between his legs at one point while skiing backwards <laughs> i mean it's amazing yeah and the, yeah. the cinematographer michael reed uh I, I did some amazing things too he he hung himself from a helicopter to capture some of these uh you know action scenes and he's dangling like with like a metal rod out of a helicopter to get some of these smooth kind of feels for what they're doing. But I think one of the, as, as we're talking about it, the action scenes, you know, we're, we're here going, oh, the, you know, the skiing, but it's just some dude skiing. And I think what the, it's a big contrast to where they were moving with Thunderball and you only live twice, where it was just all about the stunts and making everything bigger and more extravagant. And with this one, they just went, no, we're going to have it quite simple but we're going to make sure the choreography is on point. And I think it really works. I think it really works. And it, and it holds up a lot better 
than a lot of the action in this in the other Connery films. Except for Bond's, except for Bond's ski suit, looks like it's from Elton John's performance. <laughs> it's like a blue jumpsuit with bright orange goggles and like an orange toboggan. Like it's a, like it's a, it's pretty wild. It's that, sleek. That jetpack would have been super useful in this movie, though. <laughs> I think the only thing missing in this is knocking somebody off and turning a, a, a sled base into a snowboard and playing the Beach Boys. I think that's the only thing missing. Oh yeah, yeah. So, oh, so much anger. <laughs> I knew that was gonna. I knew that was gonna trigger Chad. That's why View to a Kill is the best Bond film. So uh, we won't get into that on this one. But if you ever need someone to defend, again, I love it. Give me a call. Oh, I uh, we we covered that last year. And go to go back and check it out. I'm the apologist. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh God. So, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I was removed from the show because I couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't play well with others. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. We did sub chat out that year. That that didn't happen. You're right. So <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's good that you're so passionate about it. <laughs> I, another fun little thing I loved is the the scientist throwing the uh, steaming bottle at Bond <laughs> badly in the class. <laughs> that just made me laugh. <laughs> oh, and uh, we did talk about the soundtrack already. The John Barry score at length. I, I do think we have all the time in the world is one of those classics in there. I know I get that you can't use it at the beginning, but it kind of subs in for like the theme of this movie. It, it, it kind of makes up for the fact that we didn't get that great opening song in this. And it does make another appearance at the end of No Time to Die and another one of those poignant moments we can't yet talk about. <laughs> <laughs> the embargo is yet to be lifted. Yes. Yeah, I know. It's I don't know. Ten years is our magic rule, so. Yeah, um, that's fair enough. That's fair Yeah. All right, you guys ready to hand out some awards? Let's do that. Absolutely. All right, MVP Toby. Well, you know, I'm gonna go with John Barry. He had a very interesting quote when talking about this film. He said, "Because Sean wasn't there, everybody else felt like they had to stick their oar in twice as hard to make the audience forget that they weren't watching Sean Connery." You know, so that's why we hear the Bond music. That's why we have these big brassy tunes that feel so bond and they remind you more than anything you, you know um never say never again has no bond music and even though it's got sean connery it feels less like a bond film than this and that's because of the music and uh, yeah i just think he he makes it bond you mean pac-man doesn't make you feel like bond oh. uh yeah n n now we now we can now we can have an argument <laughs> flipping street for Mortal Kombat. Let's play a game of Mortal Kombat. Whoever wins can <laughs> really tense, guys. Yeah. Chad, who's your MVP? I went with Richard Graydon. He's the man responsible for the stunt coordination. And I thought the skiing scenes, they're just so incredibly difficult to pull off. And I thought the stunts were amazing. You know, there was an amazing stunt uh, where they had like metal hooks under those gloves. And somebody's actually hanging on a gongola wire to just just to credit it more and at one point he slips off and he's hanging by one arm and he twists and he dislocates his shoulder so another another guy has to step up into there and do it now they did have wooden boxes below him so that if he fell and he did um that he doesn't fall to like to his death but uh, on the other hand um still cool like way to get up there and i can actually hang on those wires and figuring out a way to do that so yeah it yeah. was much better back in the day when we didn't have to care about accidentally killing camera workers i guess no yeah well yeah anyway the uh the my mvp is going to go to dame diana rigg i i already gushed about her earlier she's she's ter she's terrific she's awesome yeah yep i agreed absolutely uh best supporting actor toby i, I think i think you know this tell us about it's gonna be kojak yeah okay yeah yeah i told i, I did see that coming yeah, I, I don't think I need to uh, expound upon my feelings for for, Blo uh, for Blofeld. Anymore. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Chad, what about you? Best supporting actor? Diana Rigg for all the reasons that you gushed about. And I I missed her for that forty five minutes. It felt like an eternity. Yeah. Yeah, and when you meet her again, that's uh, she has to have a stunt double herself. Uh, she can't skate, even though her skating is minimal. Yeah. <laughs> That's very strange. 
So you can be tough, you can be classy, you can be smart, you can be beautiful, but nobody has it all. Diana Ray cannot skate. <laughs> so my best supporting actor is going to go to Izel uh, Stepat. She plays Irma Bunt. She is a very scary lady. Yeah, she she is tough. Uh, she's actually formidable. <laughs> she's chasing around gun with a ma- bomb with a machine gun as he's trying to call her back to London. She's uh, she's physically imposing even as a lady. She's just this really harsh, wild character. And um, in addition to make her even more evil, she's she's a total cock blocker for Hillary Bray. <laughs> she wanted it then. <laughs> Toby, who's your hidden gem? Which is oh, the underappreciated. Like this is the small guy. Like you know, yeah, yeah. The, um, you know, like the like the small piece that you know might not even show up in the credits. Or thing. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to have to go with the, the blonde dude who helps out, you know, the Draco worker. Uh-huh. Who helps the uh, Bond out and ends up getting turned into the waxwork. Okay. Uh, I, 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 there's just, there's something earthy about him. And I like the fact that um, Bond wanting to go and help him out is basically what makes Blofer realize that he's actually a spy. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. I don't know. As it, it's a hidden gem, so you wouldn't think. Yeah. Uh, I, I definitely, uh, I like, I like the uh, we're gonna hang him up right in front of you sort of thing. So uh, yeah. yeah, Chad, hidden gem. So I went with there's a janitor in Draco's headquarters, and he's whistling the theme to Goldfinger, which is just awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It absolutely is. All right. My hidden gem is Willie Wagner, the stunt skier who was part-time cameraman and, you know, just an amazing skier. Just watching him do his thing is always fun. He's fun to watch off screen. He's mm-hmm. amazing. So recast, if you had to recast somebody and put somebody in their place, Toby, who would it be? <laughs> um, well, aside from the obvious one, George. So he can't yeah. help. Um, I think I'd have to go with maybe Ruby. Angela Schlar, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there anybody you might like to put into her shoes in that case? I don't, I'm not. I'm not really too familiar with uh, with sixties actresses, but we, you'd need someone. Oh, honestly, Joanna Lumley could have done a better job. She she has a small part in this movie. Um, I think that would be an improvement. Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. I think uh, you know, Ruby, you you you're watching it and you're like, uh, he's got this lovely. You know, strong, sexy, sassy girl waiting for him um, down the mountain, and here he is going for this this Elton John looking woman. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the glasses, the wardrobe don't help yeah, her. The, the hair. hair. She's actually her face is actually pretty, by the oh, way. But yeah, like, it, no, the, 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 the the times are not kind to to Angela Schlar. <laughs> but she does yeah. play the role big too, though. Like, she I, feels I like she so. belongs more in You Only Live Twice or Diamonds yeah, Are Forever, exactly. and not exactly. so much here. That's a valid comment. That that middle part of the movie, it starts to sort of lose its identity a little bit, which might be a bit of a a commentary, a meta commentary on the film sort of becoming more of a traditional Bond film before Tracy is reintroduced. I thought I thought I thought the uh, second Angel of Death, who gets on there more, was better in terms of in terms of like very good looking. Yeah, well, yeah, it's that, but also just I thought she played the part and fit the part well. And yeah. that only made Ruby stand out more, personally. Yeah, I agree. So, I agree. Yeah. Chad, recast. No, knowing what we know, it's very, very tempting to say Sean Connery because he regrets this part. But you know what? I'm recasting Lazenby with Roger Moore. Just bringing him in earlier. Bring in Roger Moore earlier. I think he can bring in a little bit more of that tenderness. At where Connery, I I don't know, I I can't see Connery crying at the end, but I can see Roger Moore. So that's that's my recast. That's a good point. Lazenby's very tender with Tracy. Those are things that Connery, I'm sure, would have been able to conjure, but it, we had we didn't see that from his Bond. To your point, Chad. Yeah. So it, 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 I think he's a good actor and he could do it, but we didn't see it. Like yeah. Connery's Bond doesn't cry. <laughs> no. 
No, he no. slaps people that do cry. <laughs> yeah. And then has a hard drink afterwards. Correct. <laughs> we drink our feelings down. <laughs> yes, um, I agree with that. And uh, my recast, I think we've all touched on it. I mean, if you had to do it, I mean, I, I kind of lament that Sean Dennison gave this role. I think he would be amazing at it. And I think just knowing that things happened like they did, you know, coming off of You Only Have Twice, being that this movie wasn't made sooner, made that impossible. So the relationship had been severed. And so I'm going to follow suit with Toby and say Angela Schlar was, as Ruby, was a little, she, she stands out in a movie that's more grounded. And I think she's acceptable for other Bond movies. You know, if you put her in Octopussy, we're not having this conversation, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, she's in this movie and maybe Jacqueline Bisset or somebody like that would be better. So yeah, the, the tone of it, you know, the, the, the tone doesn't really work. Correct. So best shot, because, uh, you know, we, this is a pretty movie, as we talked about with Peter Hunt taking over. Toby, who's your best? Or sorry, what is your best shot of the movie? <laughs> Uh, it's not particularly artistic. I've spoken about the fact that there are beautiful shots in this film, but at heart, I'm a Bond fan. So my favourite shot is when George Lazenby is skating on his belly down the 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 run with the machine gun. And it bounce, is and awesome. Bounce, bounce, playing. It is awesome. It's perfect. It's, uh, the, 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 you know, it's such a quintessentially um, Bond moment i wanted a small cut of like somebody getting a, a stunt man getting a run in a helicopter and actually taking a dive onto his belly and then cut to george at the close-up of like running a machine gun while sliding on his belly well, yeah. it is one of the things you think about most when you first say dime uh, sorry when you say um on your majesty's secret service him holding that machine gun coming on the ice is honestly one of the first things that pops into my mind yeah, yeah. It, it's it's so bomb it's so bomb i love that whole sequence the whole sequence is... yeah yeah now chad best shot i feel bad because you you rightfully tore into this earlier on but the fight scene on the beach in the ocean when they get the lighting right and it's very inconsistent that they do super inconsistent yeah, but go on. but there are certain beautiful frame shots with great lighting where they're fighting in the ocean and i just want them to keep that consistency but it it goes night day night day night day so yeah for 30 or so frames best shot and then they go with worst shot <laughs> yeah yeah no that's a yeah. that's value there are good moments in there for sure probably what frustrates me more about it so you know you mentioned not liking this part of the plot but the engine room that bond is shoved into is my shot of the movie yeah. this is another one of those inspired sets that's beautiful like no engine room looks this good uh, like it's very dramatic it looks like there's a cavern that falls into the center of the earth um no engine room has a cavern that falls off from its mechanical equipment <laughs> into a giant pit like that um it's like it's the secret world of uh forbidden planet like that he uncovers yeah. um it, it, it's it's beautiful lighting it's a it's a great set and if it weren't for that darn fast action camera this would be uh cinematic candy but um good good work here yeah yeah Agreed. um and by the way there's a really cool shot too honors honorable mention lazenby coming up the spiral stairs there's like a metal screen that he like like that they see him coming up it looks through and as he moves up the spiral the camera pans up and to the right with him as he's coming up those spiral stairs keeping the camera on his face and you get a good feel for the layer that you're entering into and it stays on him and then it dramatically pans 180 degrees from him into the room where he's introduced to the harem of like ladies that he walks into with the angels of death and that is just i was like man they're moving the camera really well here at this mm -hmm. point like yeah. it's like that is that's, really fluid yeah so one of them was more of a set piece where i was like giving the the people who create the environment credit and this was just straight up camera work that was awesome mm -hmm. so best scene toby the end it's, ah, uh, it's a tearjerker yeah easy. i know it's i know it's easy but it, it's 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 a, it's an indelible piece of cinema uh, for me. It was one of the most audacious things I'd ever seen as a kid. And even though it annoyed me that Diamonds Are Forever completely wasted it. You know, I, I wouldn't have it any other way. I, I'm so glad it exists. Well, Diamonds Are Forever just would have been a different movie had Lazenby stayed on board. Like, you just don't get 
the, like it's a parallel universe, like I said. It, it doesn't help that Diamonds Are Forever is my least favorite Bond film, and I don't know how much of that is just me being salty about them not following up from this, but it's also pretty pretty bad in its own right. Agreed. Sure. I was gonna say you're in company with Chad. I like it because I like I like the goofy Bond where you have two wheel turns on cars and you know <laughs> I mean Winton Kid and stuff like that, but. And a redheaded American doesn't hurt for you. She's gorgeous, yes. Um, yeah. yeah, oh yeah. She doesn't do it for me. See, Ruby can be in that movie, by the way. So. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and Lana Wood, too, by the way, both of those ladies. Yeah. Sorry, huge tangent, but <laughs> back to Honor Majesty's Secret Service, Chad, best scene. I'm always down for the villains explaining the master plan. So that couch scene with Blowfield explaining the infertility plot to Bond, I think it's just captivating the tension. And even Bond saying, hey, they'll find a cure. And Blowfield's like, of course they will. But by <laughs> then, all have been paid. So who cares? And it's just, <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. I like how he kept, like, he gave him 99% of his plan. But then at the end of that speech, he goes, but that's for me to know. <laughs> right. <laughs> like all of a sudden he's mysterious. <laughs> yeah. That um, poor girl though, she's thinking she can eat chicken someday and she can't. Yeah. It's the real tragedy of this film. It it really is. There's not she, Tracy. She will never be able to enjoy KFC properly. It's un it's, 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 it's a it's, great tragedy. There's it's inhuman. There's ten young women that will never be able to eat things that they think they're going to be able to. <laughs> never mind the fact that they've been then turned into Charles Manson murder puppets. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Chad's more worried about their dietary restrictions. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like the Winter Soldier. It's not their fault. They can't remember. Right. They just, they yeah. just, but they just black out like Moon Knight, and they wake up and they're surrounded by dead people. What happened? Listen, aside yeah. from me not being attractive or female. I could put myself in this allergy clinic, so that's where I'm placing myself. I... It's a brilliant scheme, though. I mean, if you had to, if you had to destroy the world, beautiful women, a group of beautiful women, can accomplish anything. Nobody will question Absolutely. that. Yeah, yeah, no one's, yeah, no one's gonna be like, oh, you can't go in here. Exactly. <laughs> my best scene's gonna be the ski escape. It's 90 minutes into this movie, but my goodness, once this scene lets on, it is 20 straight minutes of a ski escape chase with gunmen chasing him, losing him in the ice uh, skating rink, meeting Tracy and her being his getaway driver, going through a rally, ice rally race. I mean, everything is happening, and it is 20 minutes of a chase scene that is just so much fun. All of this is great. He, like, strangles one of the gunmen coming after him, takes a ski because he, like, loses his ski, and he has to ski on one ski. It's just it's so good. And then even, like, losing them in a crowd. Normally, a Bond movie would let up at that point, but it doesn't. They follow him, and he's, like, trying to not be seen. And Tracy saves his bacon. It's really, really awesome, everything that's going on through all this part. It's it's high. It's, um, you know, it's just the best. To me, this is why Chad said, like, I'm surprised the movie is such a big hit with you, because when it's good, it's really good. Yeah. Best wardrobe or makeup moment. Uh, Toby, I'm guessing it's not going to be Ruby and her glasses and her, like, kimono, pseudo kimono shirt. Uh, no, 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 not quite. Um, for me, it's gonna have to be the kilt, uh, because uh, I, I studied. In it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a great costume, and um, I think he looks really sharp when he's Hillary Bray. To be honest, I minus the scarf. Can, minus can, the yeah, scarf. minus the scarf. But you can say a lot for Hillary Bray's uh, sense of fashion. Yeah. Yeah. Chad, best wardrobe or makeup moment? I think it's going to be Dinah Riggs' dress when we, we meet her at the casino. Oh, uh, the white one with, like, the, like, uh, pearl-type V cut on her? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a gorgeous dress with the, the liner that's going up the, the neckline. Yeah, every everything about that. She's she's a stunning individual in the first place, but that was a fantastic dress. Yeah, she even looks good in, like, a bullfighting outfit later, but you're right. When you first meet her, they... Uh... She makes a great first impression, for sure. Yeah. And um, they they show that dress off a lot too. They give her they give her like she comes towards the camera, she turns, she like kind of goes away, and uh, it's cool on, on the back too, the way that that shoulder stuff stops. So very classy, still little last piece of that classy part of the '60s and this goofier part of the '60s that's still here, and that's a good choice. I like that. That was mine. 
<laughs> I figured he'd yeah. go with the tux at the casino when he comes down with the purple wallpaper. First of all, that's very loud purple wallpaper. Yeah, um, um, he looks really good in his tux too, but again, he's got like a, it's not a cummerbund. I don't know what the term for this um, ruffly texture is. It, 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 he has that and it, it takes the, I mean, he's a, he's in excellent shape and it takes his form away from him. So I'm nitpicking here, but I mean, uh, it's no Connery in a white dinner jacket. I'll say that. So, I mean, it's, it's good. It's good, but it's also many steps above like Timothy Dalton and a windbreaker and khakis later. Yeah. Shame on them for that. What were they doing? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it looked like he was about to like go buy some Reeboks at the mall, not, not save the world. Horrible. They put Roger Moore in a, in a sports direct, uh, track suit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, change one thing. If you could change one thing and only one thing, Toby. Aside from like the entire next movie, I guess that doesn't count. I can't choose that because. Uh, no. That's, that's, yeah. yeah. Um. Uh, I'm gonna have to go with. Honestly, as you've said, the 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 quick cut, the not the quick cuts when they speed up the footage. Yeah, you know, they do it so often, and you just think, why they did it at the start of Goldfinger? They they did it all throughout the sixties, and it's always been the thing which has just pulled me out and gone. You know, there, was that really necessary? And and it still it still irritates me. So yeah, I, I, I'll change that. I just I just take all that footage out. Good and, choice. Yeah. Yeah. Chad. Yeah, there's so many things that make this movie so close to great, but are just kind of hindered by bad or lazy decisions so i i had a tough time i time to get down to one isn't it yeah i i've got to be lazy here and just go with my own this is a constant complaint with me of the movie is too long it's too indulgent it needs a dramatic cut like 30 minutes i have a huge problem with most of the daniel craig movies for being they're the ones that broke the record. It took like 20 some years or well, more than that uh, to break this movie's record because Bond movies should not be that long. A huge section in the middle without Tracy that just kind of drags. Find find something. There's There are scenes to cut. There's a lot of trim work that needs to happen here. So, and, and I there's truth to that. I think they spent a little bit too long at the lodge. The Hillary Bray stuff's a little bit too long. The, the Xeroxing debacle, as I mentioned, <laughs> like you know, going into the law office and stuff. It's good sleuthing stuff, but I mean, you have a two, uh, two and a half hour movie, basically. And I'm, I'm with you, Chad. I, I think there's a long run before the action kicks into gear. And um, that, that was a good choice. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things I would cut in this movie. However, they're staying close to the book. I feel like I want this content and a director's cut. It's fun. And I just, I'm with you. I think for a theatrical cut, that would be a great choice. My, my, um, my change one thing, and uh, I'm not going to make it Laz and B having his mold removed. So <laughs> I, 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 you know, it is tempting, Poor but, man. um, but it's going to be, don't slap Diana Rigg around. I don't like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like twice her dad does it and James does it. So yeah, she's too cool for that. Don't do that. Even if she wasn't cool, it's not cool. <laughs> don't slap a woman. Yeah. I can't even see Tracy taking that either. You know, like if, no, I, I feel like I feel like the character, like if Tracy, like we're gonna get slapped by her dad, I feel like she's slapping back. I feel like they're trying to highlight the fact that oh, they can only control her through violence. And you're like, yeah, just, just okay. Then take like one of his gunmen and put her like he's like put her over your shoulder and carry her out. Like yeah, and, like, exactly. like like that's adequate. That's effectively the same thing you're doing, but it's not so terrible. I don't. So, yeah. I don't think she's yeah. slapping her dad. Back, who's the head of a criminal syndicate? And oh, she puts him in his place. She she sees through his action. She knows that he's been bribed, and she knows exactly what his game is. And she calls him out on it. And she makes him furthermore tell James what he wants to know, so she can just be done with this whole thing. She she you know her dad loves her, and she knows that, and she has she has a fair bit of control over her dad too. So she's she's tough. That's a weird love, though. I'll pay you a million dollars if you'll just have sex with my daughter enough that she falls in love with you. That's, that's weird, man. <laughs> it's, you know, just normal fatherly yeah, love stuff. Italian. It, yeah. Yeah. It, it is not. I have a daughter. I assure you that's not a bargain. I will ever be striking. Okay. So Chad's not going to pay you a million dollars to dominate his daughter. Okay. No, okay. I will not. Okay. <laughs> Best quote of the movie. Toby. 
just never happened to the other fella. It's actually really fun. I like that. It is. It is. Is it schlocky? Yes. But do I love it? This is why I like Bond. <laughs> yeah. This is good. I'm good on Lazenby for saying it. Nowadays, I think um, actors would be a bit too uh, precious about something like that. It was uh, great. I like yeah. it. Chad, yeah. best quote. Usually, I don't like girls. <laughs> <laughs> that was the gift that kept giving. I yeah. just... In your, in your an image yourself. They, they could have actually <laughs> shown all ten girls and gone to that well ten times, and I still would have laughed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I alluded to the scene earlier, but I love the line. After telling her that he's going to wait for a wedding day, he puts Tracy up on a little bed, and he's being quite a gentleman, you know, and then, uh, then uh, you know, sitting and it's not going to be intimate, and that's this New Year's revolution. And then 30 seconds later, he takes the pitchfork, knocks out the bed platform uh, leg, and then she rolls on to him. He's like, it's not New Year's yet. <laughs> <laughs> Just that it's not New Year's yet. It's so, I was like, oh, that is so good. <laughs> I, 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 I'm surprised nobody picked the... It's quite all right, really. She's having a rest. We'll be going on soon. Too There's sad. no hurry. We have all the time in the world. Too sad. Too sad. Yeah. Uh, Probably is. It's the most iconic quote, really, isn't it? Yeah. Well, that and uh, he's got a lot of guts. <laughs> well, there, there's a lot of fun ones about... Uh, are you over your stiffness and things like that? <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a lot of stiffness re- references in this movie. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right, Toby. This is the. This is. I think I know where this is going, but I got to ask you anyway. On a five star scale, half star intervals. What do you give on Her Majesty's Secret Service? Um, I'm. I'm going to have to go with uh, four stars. Um, well, that's lower than I would have thought. You're. You're yeah, tougher. I mean, like this I'm, is your number three Bond movie. I'm surprised. A lot of them would probably go in that sort of four range. I. I think. You know, as was mentioned earlier, that the, there are there are so many amazing things about this film are just hindered by uh, sloppiness, uh, really. And and while I still think, you know, that's still eighty percent, I still think it's it's uh, really an accomplishment of cinema. Uh, the, the, there are there are some there are some problems, and it could do with. I wouldn't take off half an hour personally. I'd probably take off ten minutes. But it's uh, it's yeah. Okay. Now, Chad, five star scale, half star intervals. I gave it three and a half stars. I think it's probably the best shot and most beautiful bond with one of the most compelling female characters in the entire series. And I, I just think it's unfortunate that Lazenby was so raw. Hearing Connery say he regrets not doing this kind of hurts me more. It does. It, it's just a bit too long and. I, I think some of the repeated capturings, maybe it works in a book, but in film, I, I'm just seeing Bond getting captured four times in 30 minutes. It makes him seem less confident. So, yeah, I I bumped it down to three and a half. It's still a great movie. Like you said, it was my number 11. So I like it a lot. So I'm kind of a hybrid of like Toby and well, I, I guess I'm saying I see where Toby's coming from because after studying this in isolation in a vacuum, I see a four I see a four star movie. However, it is Bond, it is attached to a greater system of things, which makes it far more forgiving. It has an established this is what it is, and because of that it brings me so much joy. The fanboy and me gives this a four point five because I love this movie and I've watched it bunches of times and I will continue watching it and I like it more and more over time. But if you ask me to like really sit here and be like, I think this is a four star movie, kind of like Toby said, but just at the fanboy in me goes four point five. So. I, I I do agree with that. I think I'm I'm trying to approach it as critically as as I can, but I like, I just watched this movie twice in two weeks, and I didn't get bored either time. Like it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, it, it's... It, as you said, even even not perfect Bond is so much better than most other franchises. Absolutely. Now, Chad, do you want to let me pick a movie for next time? Absolutely. We've not covered a movie from Woody Allen yet, and he's a uh, he's a comic landmark uh, icon here. So we got three Woody Allen movies here for you. Option one: Sleeper from 1973. A nerdish store owner is revived out of a crystallis or a cryogenic state to in a future world to fight an oppressive government. Option two: 
Take the Money and Run from 1969, The Life and Times of Virgil St uh, Starkwell, Inept Bank Robber. And in option three, everything you always wanted to know about sex but were afraid to ask. Seven stories of trying to answer the question, what is sex? Or maybe they are not trying. Let's stay in the same year and do 1969's Take the Money and Run. All right. Uh, mockumentary feature there. So, Toby, thank you so much. The people at home don't know this, but you came on to actually fill the shoes of somebody like with 48 hours notice, and you rocked it, man. Thank you yes, so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Thanks, man, so much. Chad, thank you, and thank you all the lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable. We invite you to reach out to us because we want to hear from you. So subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcast. Give us a like on Facebook. Follow us at Twitter at, at movie underscore retro. Email us at retromovieroundtable at yahoo.com, all one word. And providing and producing this podcast is fun but not free, so we invite you to support the show at our Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash retromovieroundtable. Any contributions are much appreciated and will go towards making the show better for you, the listeners. As always, thank you for listening. Be good to each other and watch more movies. Chad? All who joy would win must share it. Happiness was born a twin. That's Lord Byron, you uneducated. <laughs> <laughs>